Postal Service is a literal lifeline. Okay. Oh, <laughs> that is Eddie, she said. <laughs> okay, so um, oh, we're recording now. So hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you have to head out at any point, that's fine. We usually post these. Um, I'm actually not sure what the delay is now that everything's a little different, but we'll post them on YouTube um, and we can send out an announcement once we do that. Um, but tonight's uh, seminar is the last in the, the semester series. So we will be taking a break over the summer. So June, July, August, we won't have a seminar, but we will have one in September. Um, we'll see if we have an in-person one or just Zoom. Um, but uh, feel free to leave suggestions for what you'd like topics to be. Um, if you're not sure what we've covered already, you can watch our past seminars on YouTube. Um, and actually, gastric ulcers have been really requested, so I'm glad we're finally getting to that. And uh, we'll be hearing from Joy today. So Dr. Joy Tomlinson, she's of course a veterinarian. She's an equine veterinarian. She's also boarded in internal medicine. Um, she did a residency. And then she also uh, has been doing research for a year, few years and is now pursuing her PhD. She has a lot of interests um, and knowledge, of course. So she has interest in infectious disease, but she also, of course, uh, being an internist, loves using a scope and has <laughs> um, actually been the only station at our annual uh, equine hospital tour that has been requested uh, both times. So it's it holds the record for the most popular <laughs> equine hospital station tour where she uh, guides people on how to use a scope to uh, scope a horse stomach for uh, some gastric ulcers. So she's, she's scoped a lot of real stomachs and a few fake stomachs as well. And she's gonna teach us about um, gastric ulcers in horses, understanding them, preventing them and treating them. And thank you very much, Joy, for being with us today. I'm happy to be here. And uh, I'll, I'll preface this talk with I'm um, presenting you the best information that we have at the moment, but there's still a lot that's not perfectly worked out. And I may say something that disagrees with your veterinarian. And there's, there's definitely some variation in what exactly is the best practice here. So um, if I say something your vet didn't say, you know, talk to them and work it out. But uh, I'm going to tell you the best we know. So um, a gastric ulcers in horses are a really big problem and something that really every horse owner should know about because um, they're just in every horse. These are the numbers that various studies have said of percent of horses in each discipline that uh, have gastric ulcers if you go looking for them. And you can see it's, it's almost every horse in every discipline, even your backyard horse might have ulcers. So um, the good thing is that not every horse with ulcers um, has clinical signs. We presume that means that it's not really painful for them or not bothering them. Um, but I guess we don't know that for sure. So it's definitely something to have in your mind as a horse owner of are you doing things that might make their risk higher? Could you do things better to decrease their risk and then if they're not quite right, could it be ulcers and what should you do about it? So we'll start out with what is an ulcer. And it's really just damage um, or erosion of the lining of the stomach. And that exposes nerves and that's what's painful. So in a healthy stomach, like we have this picture on the left, you have this really nice smooth glistening pale pink um, mucosa on top and darker pink below. And that's what it should look like. When it's ulcerated, you can see these darker red divots that are quite deep with the raised edges that's from inflammation. And you can imagine just looking at it that that looks painful. So where do horses get ulcers really in the stomach? Um, horses are different than you and I, and then even our cats and dogs and most other species in that they have two different parts of their stomach. So um, people, we have what's called a glandular mucosa, which is um, what you see on the bottom of a horse's stomach. And that is a specialized type of tissue that 
produces the acid that the stomach needs for digestion and killing bacteria um, and all those normal processes. But acid's really damaging to tissue. And so this part of the stomach has built in a bunch of protective mechanisms so that the acid that it produces doesn't eat away its own tissue. And then what horses have that's unique is the top part of their stomach is what we call squamous mucosa. And this is really more of a sort of storage area in the stomach. Um, it doesn't secrete any acid, it doesn't secrete any enzymes, it doesn't have a direct role in um, <clears throat> digestion per se. And so because it doesn't secrete the acid, it also doesn't have any of those protective mechanisms. So it's much more susceptible to injury from acid. And where we um, see a lot of problems is this line separating the two parts of the stomach is called the margo placatus, to be fancy. Um, and that is where acid from below can splash up on top. So we see a lot of problems there. The other place that we see a lot of problems is um, what's called the pylorus, and that's where food exits the stomach. So in this image, you have the esophagus is your throat where you swallow food down and it enters the stomach, and then it gets pushed back up out through the pylorus and into the small intestine. And we see a lot of ulcers right there, and I, we don't honestly know exactly why they send, tend to concentrate there. So the short end of what is causing those squamous ulcers on the top part of the stomach is that they're caused by acid injury. So in a normal horse, what's happening is that they, um, they're constantly producing acid. Unlike you and I, we produce acid only when we're eating or thinking about eating. Um, but horses are always producing acid. And so they should also always be eating uh, or frequently eating. And as they chew the food, they produce a lot of saliva and they swallow that food and the saliva. And that has a lot of buffers in it that neutralize the acid and keep that squamous top part of the stomach protected. Now what happens in a lot of our management settings is they may only get a couple meals a day. And so you have these periods where there's no food coming in in between. So there's no buffer and so you get acid building up along that margo plaquitis, along that division line, and that's when you can get ulcers there. And there's a variety of other things that can lead to buildup of acid there that we'll talk in a minute, but this is one of the more common uh, factors playing into it. So this is a, a close-up of what those ulcers might look like. So again, here's the um, glandular part that has all those protective barriers. Here's the squamous part that doesn't. And right at the border, you see these big craters where the tissue is missing. And that's a quite common appearance of gastric ulcers. Now, in reality, these are probably smaller than the tip of your finger, um, but they're enough to cause some pain. And so about 80% of ulcers that we diagnose are right here at this margo placatus. <clears throat> So in contrast, ulcers in the glandular part of the stomach, again, that part of the stomach is meant to be constantly bathed in acid. So it's not that there's suddenly too much acid causing a problem there. Instead, the problem is that these protective mechanisms break down. So there's a lot of mucus that's secreted that forms just like a film barrier on the surface. There are some buffers that are secreted that stay right there and protect the surface of the stomach. And then there's a lot of blood flow that brings sort of healing and protective factors. And so anything that disrupts those mechanisms can allow the acid to eat away at the lining and can cause an ulcer. But really the, the cause isn't the acid itself. That being said, the treatment is usually to suppress the acid and that allows it to heal on its own and reestablish the normal um, protective mechanisms. 
So some of the things that we think about and we'll talk a bit more about that can disrupt those protective mechanisms are things like stress, which produces a hormone called cortisol, and that's your stress hormone, and it can interfere a lot with blood flow and uh, many of these protective mechanisms. NSAIDs, which are your non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, um, primarily those are bute and thanamine in horses. On a theoretical basis, those can disrupt these protective mechanisms, but it's really um, not well proven in reality that that happens, or at least it only happens in very rare cases. So most gastric ulcers are not caused by bute or banamine administration. If your horse is on bute or banamine and it has ulcers, they may be interplaying and you might have to think about taking them off the, the butte or um, combining butte with ulcer treatment. Now something that's different in horses from people is that people get bacterial infections. You might have heard of Helicobacter pylori and that can directly cause ulcers in the stomach and horses don't have the same thing. We've studied it, some of the studies were done here at Cornell, and we cannot find a bacteria that directly causes ulcers in horses. So that's a big difference. <clears throat> so what are the risk factors? What are the things that we do with our horses that might predispose them to getting these ulcers? Often, it's a combination of multiple things in your horse's life. It may not be something that's really easy for you to address. Um, and it may not be just one thing that you need to think about. So <clears throat> um, in general, we don't see necessarily an age association or a breed association, although perhaps some studies have said thoroughbreds are more prone to ulcers. Other studies say warm bloods are more prone. Um, so that's not entirely clear. It's probably more an issue of management than of breed. But stress factors, how we feed them and what medications we have them on can all play in. So what are the stressors that our horses have in their lives? Housing is a big one. So um, if your horse is kept in a stall all the time, especially a stall that has solid walls between, and especially if they don't have a horse across from them that they can see, so if they can't see any other horse, that's a big stressor. If they can't touch any other horse, that's another stressor. So um, turning your horse out is better. Even a few hours a day is better than none. Full-time turnout is better than um, part-time turnout. Turnout with a buddy is better than turnout alone. But that being said, you know, you have to pay attention to your horse. So if your horse is out with a bully, that may not be better for them than being out alone. Um, another little funny tidbit that has come up in the research is that apparently playing talk radio in the barn all the time is more likely to give horses ulcers than playing music in your barn. I don't know if that's ever been repeated, but just a funny thing to think about. <clears throat> okay, another big thing is training and exercise. And this is something that is um, a problem when we talk about fixing ulcers because obviously, you know, our horses are our pets, but they're also work animals and we want, we want to do fun things with them and ride them and drive or whatever we want to use them for. But exercise in itself is going to divert blood away from the stomach and into the muscles and lungs and things you need to keep exercising. And so that does reduce the protective barriers some. The other thing it does is if you think about, you know, this horse coming down from a jump or be going up for a jump or even just cantering, um, <clears throat> is the fluid in the stomach is sloshing around in there and it's gonna go up above that dividing line and slosh onto that squamous mucosa that's not protected. And this is especially a problem if you tend to manage your horse by withholding food before you ride, which is really common for fear of colic. Um, I know when I was growing up and riding and eventing, we were told you don't feed your horse before cross country. 
And that's probably the worst thing that you could do from an ulcer standpoint. You're much better off having a little food in there that is buffering all that acid before you go sloshing it around on your horse. Um, and the other thing is just as the horse canters as or trots or as they move, the weight of their guts actually are gonna be pushing on the stomach and squishing all that fluid up on top of it. So pretty much any type of exercise um, can put them at higher risk for ulcers. The other thing is that training itself can be stressful. Any of you who've trained youngsters or tried to teach any horse a new task, you know, they might get a little bit nervous or stressed about trying to learn the new thing and that can contribute from the stress aspect as well. So feeding is a big thing that um, we have uh, created problems for horses. They're really designed to graze uh, most of the day. And uh, because of this, they do secrete acid continuously, like I mentioned before. So you and I secrete acid into our stomach just when we need it to eat, and horses are secreting always. Now, if they eat something like a grain meal, that can increase the amount of acid that they're secreting, um, but there's always some baseline amount there. So the big issue for horses is when they go more than six hours between meals, that puts them at higher risk of getting ulcers. So if you cannot have um, food available all the time, if you can at least feed a few times a day as opposed to once or twice a day, that's still a much better situation for the horse. And again, the feeding isn't the only aspect. If you have a broodmare out in the field on lush grass pasture, they're likely to have ulcers too for other reasons. And part of that is the physiological stress of pregnancy, perhaps how much grain they're being fed and other things. So if you can't have your horse living out on lush grass pasture all year, like we can't do in the winter here, it's okay, there are other things that we can do. <clears throat> So another aspect of feeding is grain. You'll hear this come up a lot. Um, if your horse needs concentrated feed to maintain weight, that's fine. You just need to um, use appropriate feeds and appropriate amounts. So the horse should not be getting more than 10 pounds of grain a day. But there are plenty of pelleted feeds we have that aren't really grains. So there's um, like senior feeds or uh, ultium, which is a, a higher fat senior feed essentially, that can help your horse get some extra calories in a, <clears throat> in a smaller meal and not really increase the risk for ulcers. Um, feeding your grain before you've fed them any hay can increase risk for ulcers, and this is because the grain does stimulate some acid production, but they don't um, often chew quite as much and get as much saliva going as when they're chewing hay. So a little bit of hay before the grain is a good idea. And then the higher starch the grain is, the more it promotes acid. Um, and it's broken down, it's digested into other types of acid that compound the problem in the stomach. So lower starch feeds, higher fat feeds are all better ideas for these horses. Okay, so we've talked about what can cause ulcers. Um, did it, I don't know if anyone had any questions so far. I think you're good to go. Okay, so what, you know, I said you should all be aware that horse, your horse might have an ulcer, but how do you tell? And um, that can be hard because often the signs are really subtle or they may not really show you any signs. And then um, conversely, they may have something else going on and that can cause ulcers and then you're stuck in a little bit in a chicken or egg situation. So some of the things that you might see are colic is probably one of the more severe um, signs that you see with gastric ulcers. They're not usually rolling around on the ground like this picture. Um, that would be a really rare manifestation of uh, gastric ulcers, 
but they can be that kind of mild colicky after you feed them the grain, they're pawing or flank watching, or they go stand in the corner and don't want to finish their hay, and they're just not quite right, especially around feeding times. <clears throat> Again, the problem we have here is there are a variety of other causes of colic, and those can give the horse ulcers because then they're being withheld from feed to resolve the other cause of colic, or they're not eating well, or they're uh, stressed, or there's other direct issues there. <clears throat> and um, I think it's something like 80% of horses that colic have gastric ulcers, but treating the ulcers only solves the uh, chronic colic is repeated mild colic is what I'm talking about right now. Um, only a quarter of those are cured by treating the ulcers. So ulcers are not always the direct cause of this chronic colic, but they can be part of the problem. Okay, and then other things that are ascribed to ulcers are uh, also really sort of non-specific and hard to pin down the precise cause, but they may have poor body condition, maybe they're picky eaters, it's hard to get the calories in them, they don't eat enough hay to maintain their weight. Um, they, uh, yeah, they may be just kind of vague poor doers. They can also have a poor hair coat involved with that. Behavior change is probably the thing that's reported most often. So a previously happy horse suddenly gets grumpy or girthy, doesn't want to be groomed, is sour under saddle, um, just generally kind of a, a horse turning unhappy can be a sign of, you know, their stomach hurts constantly. If your stomach hurts constantly, you're not going to want to be happy all the time either. <clears throat> and then poor performance, this is always a question for those squamous ulcers, those more common ulcers, how much they contribute to performance. Again, I would say if you, you know, if your belly hurts every time you exercise, I would think you're going to have worse performance. Um, but there's pretty good evidence that the, the glandular ulcers uh, really do affect performance. And um, Often it's noticed in the riding horses or the performance horses. And sometimes it's subtle enough that it's not what brings, you know, brings the horse in to see the vet. But once we fix the ulcers, the rider will be like, oh my gosh, this horse feels so much better, so much more willing to work. I have a new horse. So there's definitely some effect in there. So how do you tell? All those signs are pretty darn nonspecific, and you may be looking at other things, like is there lameness, back pain, um, anything else going on. But if you want to really look for the ulcers, the only way to truly diagnose those is through gastroscopy. So what's involved here is you have to fast the horse, so no food overnight, and then uh, no food on the trailer, that's a big one, bring them into the vet, and we stick a camera up their nose. There are a few vets, especially um, locally, some ambulatory practices are starting to get these scopes that they can bring out to your farm. So if coming into the clinic is a problem, that's becoming available. Um, but right now, we're the ones uh, you would come to here at Cornell, and we'll stick the scope up their nose and drive a camera down into the stomach and we can see the whole lining of the stomach. And um, that's really the only way that you can know for sure that the horse has ulcers. Here's some more examples. Um, you have a healthy, beautiful stomach starting on top and then uh, just some loss of that surface light pink lining. Sometimes it's you know otherwise flat, sometimes there's a lot of buildup of other irritated inflamed tissue. Um, this one has almost no normal stomach left. And then this poor horse, it's really deep and actually bleeding. So you can really imagine how painful these things must be. So when we do a, a gastroscopy, if your horse has ulcers, we will give them a grade. This really helps us monitor how well they're responding to therapy. But the funny thing about ulcers is that the grade doesn't necessarily correlate with how bad the clinical signs are. 
So your horse may have the lowest grade ulcer and find that very painful. So even if they're low grade, it's, it's often worth treating them and seeing if the horse responds. <clears throat> okay, many of you may have heard about this thing called a fecal occult blood test. The brand name is Succeed. It's really sexy. You have this little test at the farm. You can take a sample of their poop and say magically, yes, there's ulcers or there's no ulcers. Well, I'm gonna burst your bubble a little bit. It really, it doesn't work at all. Um, even though they have put out time and again, new and improved, we have research. Um, if you look at the, the wider body of research, it has a huge rate of false positives and false negatives. And basically, you could just toss a coin and get as close an answer to the truth. So um, I, I am very against using this test, personally. OK, now another thing a lot of people want to do is a treatment trial. Instead of, of scoping the horse, um, say, why don't I just treat him for ulcers? And if he gets better, then problem fixed, right? Uh, I would argue there are a few reasons that it is worthwhile to do the scope and know for sure what you're dealing with. One of them is that if you start with a treatment and you think your horse is getting better, there is still what we call a placebo effect, which is that because you are treating the horse or giving the horse a drug, you feel like they're, they're better, uh, even though they may not feel any better. But you start interpreting their actions differently, something you might have thought was colicky the week before. You're like, oh, no, he's treated. He's fine right now. Um, so you run the risk that you're not actually helping your horse any. Um, the other thing is that is some of the, especially the um, non-brand name treatments or the supplements that you can buy over the counter for ulcers, they may act uh, a bit like a band-aid. And so they make the horse feel better when you give them for a couple hours, but they don't actually heal the problem and they don't last for very long. So most of the day, your horse is not feeling so great, but right when you're there and you give the supplement, the horse is feeling better. And then the opposite is a, a problem also. So say you give the medication and the horse is no better. And so you say, well, they definitely don't have ulcers and you move on to other things or you stop treating. And that's not necessarily true. It might be that you had the wrong dose or the wrong drug or didn't treat for long enough. And so you're also having a little bit of a disservice there by not knowing exactly what you're treating. And then finally, um, we've, I've talked in the beginning of this talk about how the horses have the two different types of ulcers, the squamous ulcers and the glandular ulcers. And that's important because um, they do need slightly different treatment and you have different expectations for how long it's gonna take to, to cure those. So it's worth knowing that up front and being able to monitor how well they're responding to treatment and decide if you need to change medications or change strategies or change your management at home. So um, unsurprisingly, as an internist, I highly recommend that you get a gastroscopy done, but that is going to be a personal choice between you and your veterinarian. Now, one reason that a lot of people don't come to us for scopes is finances. Um, these are some of the costs. Right now in our hospital, a gastroscopy is only about $300. And if you wanted to try a month of a treatment trial, if you use the correct drug, that's Gastrogard, and that's about $1,000. Um, I would say of the horses that come in to be scoped for ulcers, we probably have 50-50 at least that don't have ulcers. So you would be saving yourself $700 there. And again, even if they do have ulcers and it's an added cost, I do think there's benefit to knowing what you're dealing with and um, being able to be sure that you have treated it effectively. <clears throat> and then again, if you do a treatment trial with some of these um, over-the-counter supplements, that's a lot cheaper depending on what you choose. 
Um, but again, it may not be curing the problem. And so are you really helping your horse? Uh, or you try one, it doesn't help. You try another, it doesn't help. Then how many months are you wasting with the horse not being able to be in full work or not in good body condition? Um, and uh, where does that really uh, get you in the end? So those are my thoughts on diagnosis. Joy, do you want to take a couple questions? Yes. Okay. We have, do other rich foods such as alfalfa promote gastric ulcers if not properly uh, portioned? So alfalfa actually is the opposite. So it's rich in terms of its high protein, uh, but it also has a lot of natural buffers in it. It has calcium, which is like when you take a Tums tab, you're taking calcium. And so alfalfa actually can be pretty good for ulcers. Great, one more. Uh, can pain from gastric ulcers manifest as referred pain? Oh, good question. Yes, I would say it's probably not common. Referred pain in any situation isn't that common. Um, and I don't know exactly where you would be seeing it, but say perhaps the horse has gastric ulcers because they're protecting their belly and splinting they may end up with muscle pain or back pain um, or general reluctance to kind of work and go so yes in that sense great one more just came in from Kelly um, I hear everyone talk about front gut versus hind gut ulcers what is the difference and is there a difference in treatment huh? I have a slide at the very end for that, but we'll, we'll fast forward to it now. Um, I'm gonna go on a little soapbox here about hind gut ulcers. So four gut ulcers are the stomach. That's what we are talking about in this talk. Hind gut ulcers are a made up thing by supplement companies, basically. Um, there are some medical conditions that affect the quote unquote hind gut, which is the large colon of the horse. Uh, namely, that would be right dorsal colitis or inflammatory bowel disease are the ones that we really worry about. And those I think are mixed in with this term of hind gut ulcers. Um, but just plain old ulcers in the hind gut, like we see in the stomach, aren't really a thing and they're not acid mediated and uh, the diagnosis uh, or the diagnostic tests that you run are different and the treatment is different. So if, um, if anyone is telling you that your horse has hind gut ulcers and needs a special diet or supplement for it or whatnot, I would urge you to reach out to your veterinarian or to a, a veterinary specialist like an internal medicine specialist um, and really sort that out because um, there's a lot of things that are ascribed to that term inappropriately, I would say. <clears throat> and a lot of it is based on that succeed fecal blood test that I hate. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Tell us how you really feel, Joy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not shy on that one. <laughs> Thank you. There are problems you can have in the hind gut, but I think uh, I don't like the term hind gut ulcers because I think it confuses people as to what's going on. <clears throat> all righty, so treatment for, for gastric ulcers is really all about a, <clears throat> acid suppression. And this is again, whether or not it's in the, the squamous part or the glandular part, acid suppression is still really important. <clears throat> and uh, we tend to treat when there are symptoms present or when you can't get rid of the predisposing factor. So it's show season or race season, you can't just turn the horse out and let them have a break. Um, but usually anytime we diagnose ulcers, we're treating them. The best choice by far, if you remember nothing else, is Gastrogard, which is a special form of the drug Omeprazole. Now, Omeprazole is the, oh, I thought I had those on permanently, sorry. <clears throat> Lights turned off on me. So omeprazole is the generic name of the actual drug. And so there's a lot of different forms that you can find out there. Gastrogard is the only one 
that is approved by the FDA. And then there's a bunch of other products that we call compounded omeprazole, which means they're not approved and they really should not be labeled for treatment of ulcers because there's no evidence that they work and there's no quality control that they have the drug that they say they have in them. And so this is an example of an older study kind of showing what you're getting when you buy these compounded products. So in the first group of horses, they started out with ulcers that had a, a severity of two and a half score on average. And if you treated them with Gastrogar, the, the brand name product, um, those ulcers almost completely resolved. And then if you switched after they were nearly resolved, if you switched over to this compounded product, they start getting worse already in face of being on supposedly full treatment with this compounded product. And then again, if you do that in the other order, so if you start with your horses with ulcers and you give them the compounded drug, it's really hardly helping any horses at all, but those horses will respond if you then give them the gastrogard. Um, <clears throat> this is a huge problem in our industry and the FDA has taken notice and over the last six years or so they've repeatedly issued warnings to all these companies listed here saying that they are selling products inappropriately. They're marketing the products as treatment when they are not proven to do so, they're not licensed to do so, and when the FDA tests these products they find that they contain hugely variable amounts of the, of the actual drug in Meprazole. So they might only have a third of the dose in them that they should have, or they might have extra drug in them, which isn't necessarily good either. So just be really careful when you choose a drug. If it's not Gastrogard, you don't necessarily know what you're getting. You don't know how much you're getting, and you don't know if you're actually treating your horse. <clears throat> The reason people turn to all of these is that they're cheaper, usually. So, <clears throat> I swear I'm not paid by the company that makes Gastrogard, I'm just a believer. We have two formulations in the US. We have Gastrogard paste, which is labeled as the treatment um, product, and it is prescription, and you give the whole tube to a horse once a day. And that's about $40 to $50 a day. So it's a, it's a significant financial reach for a lot of people. UlcerGuard is exactly the same product labeled for prevention of ulcers. And so you give the horse a quarter of a tube a day and it's a quarter of the treatment dose. So a full tube of UlcerGuard is the exact same as a full tube of Gastrogard in a different box. And the ulcer guard is over the counter, it's not prescription, and it's significantly cheaper. In other countries, they do have some other products available that are um, tested and work, and uh, gastrozole is an example, and we are hopeful that someday we will get some of these other things in the US and have a little competition. Um, but right now, it's really just gastrogard and ulcer guard. And the big reason this is important is because omeprazole is um, degraded in the stomach if it's not protected. And so this Gastrogard product has a, a, a buffering system or an enteric coated system or the two types of protection that you can get for omeprazole that allow it to get through the stomach and get absorbed into the blood, which it has to do to work. So that's um, my second or third soapbox for the day, which is uh, use the FDA approved medications. Now there's one um, little caveat to that is that the um, gastrogar works much better for squamous ulcers than it does for those glandular ulcers. And um, there has been a recent study that uh, was out of Australia where they used a long acting injectable form of omeprazole and it did much, much better in healing glandular ulcers. And so there, if your horse had glandular ulcers, this might be something that your vet will be looking at. 
the problem is that it's not um, it's not approved yet in the U.S. So there is not a tested, validated formulation here in the U.S. And various compounding pharmacies have been trying to recreate the Australian product with variable results. So there have been some issues with um, injection site reactions and efficacy that have made some of the compounding pharmacies um, pull the product and not sell it anymore or have uh, resulted in back orders or have resulted in people um, this all happened about a year ago and vets were really excited about it and I think the enthusiasm has waned. So I'm not sure this is something I would reach for right now, but I am still very hopeful that someone will sort this out in the near term and we will have a product like this available soon. Um, <clears throat> even though it's only once a week injection, uh, it's, it's probably not actually any cheaper than the GastroGuard. I looked up the price online and it looked like it'd probably be reasonably pricey. So, some details about your GastroGuard administration <clears throat> and how well it works. There's definitely horse-to-horse -horse variation in how well they absorb it and how well they respond to it. So, not every horse is going to um, cure perfectly in the first couple of weeks. Some of them need longer treatment. And um, one of the factors that's really important in healing is that for squamous ulcers, you need the acid to be suppressed for at least 12 hours out of the day. And that's true for pretty much every horse on GastroGuard. It'll work for 12 hours before it starts to wear off. So it works really well for those squamous ulcers. What's a little more variable is that for the glandular ulcers, it seems like maybe they need more than 16 hours a day <clears throat> suppressed for acid suppression. And that varies maybe some <clears throat> horse to horse. And um, so one of uh, the aspects that we can use to optimize how long a horse suppresses is make sure that they um, adequately absorb the dose. So we give the horses a, a full tube of GastroGuard is the treatment dose. And there's been a, a, some studies using other formulations and GastroGuard itself suggesting that a half dose is probably actually enough for most horses. But the full dose is still a little bit safer if you don't give the drug under the ideal feeding conditions. So for the GastroGuard to be fully absorbed and to work at its absolute best, your horse has to have been off feed for at least eight hours before you give the drug. <clears throat> and this goes against everything I've just said about risk factors for ulcers and keeping them comfortable and everything. But while the horse is on GastroGuard, while they're being treated for the ulcers, you do actually want to withhold feed, usually overnight, and give it on an empty stomach. So if you can do that really well, you might be able to uh, use a half dose for treatment. If you can't, you're better off using the full dose for treatment for sure. <clears throat> and I expect more research to come out on this on whether the half dose is something that we can just recommend for everybody. So again, you want to feed them on an empty or give the GastroGuard on an empty stomach if you can and uh, leave them with no food for uh, about an hour before you give them their breakfast. And then again, counterintuitively, they do better if you feed them grain during the GastroGuard treatment. And this is because once the drug gets into the bloodstream, <clears throat> it, it works by binding the um, acid pumps in the stomach. So the little proteins that push out the acid into the stomach, um, the, the GastroGuard binds to that and blocks it. But it can only bind when those pumps are activated. So if you give the medication, give them an hour to absorb it, and then feed them some hay, and then a little grain, the grain will really stimulate all those pumps to get active and all the omeprazole can bind them. And then once the omeprazole is bound, 
they should be protected again for most of the day from producing acid. All right, hope that wasn't too confusing. <clears throat> so the end result is that uh, most horses will heal squamous ulcers um, in a month on gastroguard treatment. And this data is a little bit outdated. So it's back when we went ahead and uh, used the gastroguard while the horses were on free choice hay. So this was not with any of the um, giving the gastroguard on an empty stomach. So it could be a little bit better if we use those techniques that we've now learned are better. Probably for most of these horses, they're better in 21 days. Um, and it's only a few that need the extra time. In contrast, those glandular ulcers that we've said are a little bit more problematic, only about a quarter of those will heal in a month of treatment. And usually they need two to three months of treatment. And this has been seen as a failure of the treatment initially because we were used to how well um, it worked for the squamous ulcers. But if you look at ulcers in say people who have the same sort of glandular stomach, if you have a true ulcer, it often takes months of treatment for it to heal as well. So I think this is just, it's mostly part of the disease. Now again, there was that one study that showed that long acting injectable healed um, three quarters of, of the horses with glandular ulcers in only two weeks. Um, but that study hasn't been repeated and we don't really have good access to the injectable right now. So again, that's something to look for on the horizon. Okay, so there are a couple other drugs that we do use sometimes, especially more with the glandular ulcers. And so I'll, I'll introduce those a little bit here. Um, sucralfate is the, probably the next most common one that we use. You use it with gastroguard, and we use it especially for glandular ulcers or really deep bleeding. Um, squamous ulcers. And it's a funny little drug. It's um, often a powder or a slurry when you get it. And it's caraphate in people if anyone has taken it, same thing. And it forms actually like a band-aid on injured tissue. Um, we'll even sometimes use it like in foals that have um, pressure wounds from lying down all the time. If they're really sick, you can put this on and it, it forms this sort of natural band-aid. And in addition to covering that tissue, which sort of provides a soothing effect, it covers the nerves so they're not getting stimulated, um, it protects it from acid, but it also directly promotes a lot of the acid protection mechanisms that the stomach normally has. So it'll promote mucus secretion, and, and um, buffer secretion and increases blood flow and really generally does every all good things at once. The trouble with sucralfate is that to work its best it should be given two to four times a day and it's a pain in the patootie to give because it binds to everything. Since it has this lovely band-aid effect it's not only for uh, ulcers that it'll bind to. It'll bind to the food, it'll bind to other medicines, it'll bind to anything it sees. So it's really best to also give this on an empty stomach um, and it has to be spread out at least an hour from your other medications. So now we're talking about telling you that the best thing to do to treat your ulcer horse is not feed it overnight, come in, give it its gastrogar, probably while everyone else in the barn is getting fed, wait an hour. Now you give it sucralfate, wait an hour. And you can imagine that um, you, the horse owner or the facility manager or the horse itself, nobody's happy with this situation. So this is a, a, an issue where we can say this is the theoretical best practice, but I would say that probably it gets given with food or other medications often, and it still has some effect. We do see horses get better with it. So you do the best you can. Ideally, it would be given on an empty stomach and without any other medications. Ideally, it would be given four times a day, but in reality, it's probably given twice a day, and as long as you don't give it with the gastroguard, that's probably about as good as you can do. 
So that's super fit. <clears throat> and then mesoprostol is the other one that we use quite a bit. Um, it, on, again, on a theoretical basis, it interferes with GastroGuard and you shouldn't give them together. That being said, in horses that don't respond well to GastroGuard, we often add on top mesoprostol and they get better. So um, there's always sort of a difference between theory and practice. So you may see them given together or you may see them given separately. Mesoprostol, like sucrophate, promotes a lot of those natural protective mechanisms that the stomach has. It promotes blood flow, it promotes mucus secretion. It's also anti-inflammatory. Um, so it's all around a pretty good drug, but uh, won't be for those squamous ulcers because those are really all about acid and the mesoprostol is not as good an acid suppressant. So this is more for glandular ulcers. Now mesoprostol has some unfortunate side effects. It can cause horses to get really crampy and colicky and it causes abortions in people for sure and likely also in horses. So you have to be careful about who is handling the drug um, and make sure that they're informed and take protections if they might be pregnant or want to be pregnant. Okay, so that was a summary of drugs. Hey Joy, we have quite a few questions related to drugs. Do you want to get through those yeah. before we move on? All right. Um, any classic clinical pathologic findings that are helpful? Uh, for diagnosis, no. There's no blood test that you can do. That's why we're really reliant on the scope. And that's different than the, the quote-unquote hindgut ulcers, the actual things that cause problems in the large intestine. Some of those will show up signs in the blood work, like low protein um, or inflammation. After 30 days of GastroGuard, what is the recurrence in frequency and time? Uh, I don't think that's as well established. And um, so if you document that they are healed, if you document that they are healed at 30 days um, and you have done nothing to fix the underlying issues and you have them on no preventive treatment, they could easily start to recur within a week. So um, it becomes definitely a management issue of seeing if you can identify what was predisposing that horse and change your management to reduce it um, or potentially keep them on some preventive maintenance medication. And we will talk about some of those things in a minute. Uh, could ulcer guard be used as an equivalent treatment to gastroguard? Well, I can't officially tell you that, but I can tell you that the two tubes are exactly the same. Hint, hint. Wink, wink. Thank you. Uh, would it be beneficial to give half dose twice daily for glandular ulcers? You know, that's something I think about a lot and we've talked about in the scientific meetings and just no one's done the research on it yet um, to see how much drug would build up, if you could get to high levels or if it could be a, a problem in any way there. So um, I, I have a hard time recommending that right now. If we are desperate, I, I believe I have suggested it in a case that was, really wasn't responding to anything. Um, but as a blanket statement, I, I can't say right now that that's the right idea. Okay, would GastroGuard be administered to brood mares or would there be negative effects on the foal? Uh, it should be safe for brood mares, yeah. Okay, uh, sucrophate comes in several different forms. Liquid pill or powder is one better than another. Is cribbing a sign of ulcer specifically for one who cribs mainly during meals only? Mm, good question. So the different forms of sucrophate um, uh, don't matter. I think pills are hard to get in a horse if you're not 
you know, if they're not eating it with grain meal, and again, you don't really want to be giving it with a grain meal. Uh, similarly, if you have a powder and you're not feeding it on grain, then you're mixing it up into a slurry. So basically, no matter which form you get from the store, it should end up as a slurry being squirted in your horse's mouth. Um, in terms of cribbing, cribbing itself does not cause ulcers, nor does it really appear that ulcers cause cribbing. You might see them both in the same horse because cribbing is a stereotypical behavior that can be associated with stress, um, but they don't seem to be causing each other. Hi, Joy. Um, and then there's a question about uh, the use of aloe or aloe juice, as well as quality uh, changes in the quality of hay or changes in hay. Okay, so aloe, um, we'll get to supplements in a second. In general, um, aloe and pectin lecithin and seed buckthorn berries, and there's a, a whole variety of supplements that are advertised for ulcers. Um, they may or may not help your horse feel more comfortable, but none of them are likely to heal any ulcers that are there. So I would not recommend using any of those as your primary treatment if you know your horse has ulcers or you suspect your horse has ulcers. If you have treated your horse and are trying to prevent recurrence, um, it's up to you if you want to try those kinds of things knowing that they may or may not be working. And uh, what was the, there was a second part of that question. Yeah, sorry. Um, and then they were wondering whether the quality of hay or the changes in hay can affect uh, ulceration. I think we understand a little bit less about how hay itself affects it. There's some things like um, feeding straw, which is done, I think, more in Europe, especially for fat horses, um, is uh, promotes ulcers. Um, there was a lot of thought that you need like a full hay or long stem hay is better, but there have been actually some studies saying the opposite, that if you have a, a like a complete feed where it's really finely chopped hay, um, that that's no worse for having ulcers. So the change of diet or like one load of hay to the next is probably not a huge factor in this um, disease complex, but hard to say for an individual horse, an individual situation that that didn't contribute. Okay, thank you. There, there are a few more questions, but uh, you might as well finish up and then we can try to get to any that are left. Okay. Thank you. All right. So a couple of things to think about, um, both while you're treating the horse for the act of ulcers and in terms of prevention um, or exercise. I think we often forget to talk about this when we put the horse on GastroGuard. If you can, it is better to reduce exercise while they're being treated. Um, these are just gratuitous pictures of my horse being silly recently. But uh, there's horses that are ridden five to seven days a week are more likely to have ulcers. We know that exercise reduces all those protective mechanisms in the glandular part of the stomach, and we know it splashes acid onto the squamous part of the stomach. So less intense exercise, less frequent, max four days a week, would really be the best thing to help them heal. That being said, um, those studies on the rate of healing with gastroguard treatment usually leave the horse in full work assuming the horse has a job, they need to do their job and they're performing well enough. So um, this is something that you can do to help, but is not an absolute requirement. Um, if you have a horse that is really prone to ulcers and you can't keep them managed and they're a full-time show horse ridden six days a week, then that may be an indication that the horse can't handle that workload. And you could see if they do better with less exercise and if they do, sadly, it might be that that horse just needs to drop down a level. <clears throat> so 
So other things we do to talk about prevention is going a lot back to those risk factors we described in the beginning. So evaluate how your horse is living. Do they have a neighbor that they hate, especially around feeding time, say? Can you reorder the stalls so that they're happier? Um, is it a horse that gets really excited at feeding time and is just pawing and pawing and pawing or kicking the walls? Um, it's better to go ahead and feed a horse like that first. The longer you make them wait, the more stressed they are, and you're not like training them out of that bad behavior. They're actually just learning that it takes 20 times of kicking the wall instead of one time to get fed. So um, that's something that you might be able to change. We just talked about exercise, um, turnout again. The more you can turn the horse out, find them a buddy they get along with or some environmental enrichment um, just to keep them entertained and happy. Those are all really good things for them. Although if you give it, uh, not every horse would appreciate a big pasture ball like this one. Feeding, this one is harder to give precise recommendations. Like I was mentioning a minute ago in response to that question um, about, hey, we don't know exactly, and it may vary for every horse, and studies say different things, but the general concept is that frequent or constant access to forage, that being hay or pasture, is ideal. Alfalfa can be good. In fact, alfalfa plus even a high starch grain is often better than um, a plain grass hay diet. And in general, you want 75% of their diet to be roughage, being your hay or your pasture. And again, no more than 10 pounds of true grain per day. To help spread out the meals, a hay, a hay net or slow feed hay net can help make them take longer to eat their hay meals. If you've got a horse that say is overweight and you can't just put buckets or you know, bales of hay in front of them. And then generally try to reduce carbohydrates. If they need the calories, add them in with fat um, and small meals. And so a lot of the feeds that are aimed for metabolic syndrome horses can be useful also for ulcer horses because they're low starch. And you can just pour some corn oil on to increase the calories if they um, need the extra energy. And then uh, we do talk about medications for prevention. This would be your ulcer guard in this case, that quarter tube dose. Some horses are just so prone to ulcers and you can't find a situation that keeps them happy and they live on a quarter dose a day ulcer guard. That's probably not ideal, at least in people, long-term administration can have some side effects. We have not identified any of those side effects in horses to date. It doesn't mean that they're not there. Um, so the alternative is say you um, know things that are stressful for your horse, you can give the ulcer guard starting a couple days before the stressful event and continuing through it and a few days after. So if you have to ship your horse, you turn them out in a new pasture with new friends, you take them to a show, um, all those things you could potentially prepare the uh, horse with ulcer guard just around that stressful time. If you have a pleasure horse at home that nothing changes in his life and you can't get, of his, get rid of his ulcers, obviously that approach isn't gonna work and you're left more with the consistent medication approach. And then we come to supplements. Um, there's tons of supplements on the market. Many of them have, um, I'm gonna pick on, on Smart Pack at the moment, but many of them have these things saying that they're backed by research or by clinical trials. And you have to be a little bit savvy about how you read that and not necessarily take them directly at their word. So a lot of this clinical research is funded by the company that's trying to sell you the product, which means that they may not be telling you the whole story about how well it worked, or they may not have really designed the study perfectly or ideally, to show how well it works or not. So for example, Smart Gut Ultra, they did a study and it showed that these pellets, if you have a horse with ulcers, you treat the ulcers with GastroGuard and you cure the horse. If you give the Smart Gut Ultra afterward to prevent recurrence, it does help 
for about a month. At the end of a month, the horses were the same as if they weren't on supplementation. So there is some research there that it helps, but is that really what you need out of that product? Maybe not. You're looking probably for something to keep the horse on all the time that'll really help prevent. So that being said, you know, maybe in some horses it works better and maybe it'll work for your horse. It's really hard to say. Similarly, there's um, this pictures of the actual product that was tested in the clinical trials. There's this C. buckthorn berry has shown some promise for preventing recurrence of glandular ulcers. Again, it doesn't treat them if they're there, but it might help after you've treated to keep them from coming back. How well it works, I can't really say. And then antacids again, like Nalox, and um, there's a bunch of other calcium and magnesium-based uh, supplements. Those are, those are again like Band-Aids. Yes, they might make your horse feel comfortable while they're eating their grain meal, but they're not gonna prevent ulcers from happening and they're not gonna treat ulcers that are already there. So they might make your horse more comfortable, but they're not fixing the problem. They also only last for about an hour or two after you give it. So if you give that <clears throat> um, and then the horse is happy while you're there and you leave, then they may be feeling ulcer pain the rest of the day while you're not watching. Okay, and then I think we talked about hindgut ulcers a little bit. So I think that is, um, we've gone a little bit over time. So I'll stop there and take any additional questions. So there were a few additional questions. One is having to do with um, if a horse has to be on uh, systemic steroids for some other reason. So this case, um, their horse is on prednisolone for lymphoma. Um, and they're wondering whether the risk of recurrence of ulcers with long-term use, um, if, if that's a concern in their case. So we don't usually see ulcers associated with steroid use. That being said, if your horse has documented ulcers in the past, it might be worth putting them on a preventive dose. Um, and then someone else is asking, uh, sorry, <laughs> there are quite a few questions. Can sucralfate be given without gastroguard treatment? It has not been shown to, um, cure ulcers. So it will be like the antacids. It'll make them feel better probably. Um, if you remove the other predisposing causes, then they might be able to fix. But if, if they're still under the same maintenance and um, not much else is changing, then sucralfate is probably not gonna do the trick by itself. And we don't ever really prescribe it by itself in adult horses. It's different in foals. Foals, um, they get ulcers not necessarily from acid, and they tend to have already a really basic environment in their stomach. And so we don't necessarily use, I'm talking really baby foals, a uh, few days old. Um, we tend to use sucralfate alone in those more often. Um, and then I got a question I think we already kind of addressed. They're asking if ulcers affect pregnancies, and you had commented on brood mares um, before. So. Pregnancy, I don't think so. Brood mares, a lot of brood mares can have ulcers. Usually they go completely unrecognized. You're not asking them to exercise too much. They tend to um, often be on pasture or be on free feed because you want them to have the calories. And so they're kind of always buffering their own ulcers. Um, so a lot of them have them. I don't know how many are having a problem from them. And I really don't think they're affecting the foal. Um, and then there's also a question uh, about ranitidine. So is that effective in treatment mm -hmm. of cancer? Uh, ranitidine is close to my heart. So. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in my internship, we did, uh, we used a lot of ranitidine. The problem and the reason I took it out of this talk is that it's been having some problems with manufacturing with contaminants and with causing 
um, significant health problems in people. I think it's causing cancer or liver disease or something, I've forgotten. Uh, but it's basically come off the market and it's gonna be unavailable is my understanding. Um, if it is available or if it becomes available separately for horses, it doesn't work as well as Gastrogard if the horse stays in full work. So the comparison studies were mostly done in race horses that stayed in full training. And the same would be a performance horse staying in full training. So in those horses, Gastrogard is still really the one to go to. If you can back off for a while and change your horse's um, exercise and environment, then the renidity might work equally as well. It has to be given three times a day though, which is really hard for most people, myself included, I couldn't do that. Um, and if you give it only twice a day, it's not gonna be effective for most horses. Now I used to like it as a um, maintenance. Um, once you've treated a horse, you could sometimes keep horses on twice a day renididine instead of the ulcer guard as a, a long-term preventative. Um, but I, I don't think that option is going to be available to us anymore. Okay, awesome. I think we may have covered all the questions. <laughs> Mm -hmm. A very popular topic, I guess. So thank you very much, Dr. Tomlinson. Um, and just as a plug, I guess, if your local veterinarian does not have the ability to scope horses on your farm, um, you can come to Cornell where they do scope horses. <laughs> so um, in here, but I should have, and I will mention it. We are currently running a clinical study um, to look at the cause of the glandular ulcers and whether there might be a virus involved. We don't have any results yet, so I can't tell you whether it is or not, but if you come and you are interested, we will be asking you to kindly let us have some samples from your horse. <laughs> Good plug, okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tomlinson, and thank you everyone for attending. Um, if uh, you missed the beginning or anything, we'll be posting this seminar on YouTube uh, probably in a couple weeks. So thank you again, every, everyone. And um, it was good to see you all in the chat. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs>